who would uh, <coughs> share his experience of how to treat uh, CML. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, some of my slides have been shown, so I try to skip them or go fast over them and give you what I feel, what I do at MD Anderson today. So the outcome of CML has changed drastically from a disease where survival used to be six to seven years and transplant the only way to cure to a chronic disease like diabetes or hypertension where we'll live with it provided we're taking our medicine. So I can say today CML is an indolent disease. Patient can be functionally cured and live their normal life provided they continue their treatment with TKI, imatinib, or others. CML is now a condition like diabetes, hypertension, coronary disease, which treated appropriately should result in normal life. So these are survival curve from our institution, uh, not from, excuse me, survival curve, yes, from institution published uh, recently about the contagion, showing survival curves by era of therapy, and today, 10 year survival is 90%. Short answer, no transplant upfront for any patient in a chronic phase. So the problem with CML is financial problem as well, because this patient will take TKI forever. Well, unless we stop them in clinical trials. In the US, TKI costs seven to ten thousand dollars per month. Survival is twenty-five years and longer. The incidence is the same, the prevalence is decreasing. So we expect in 2050 to have around two hundred thousand cases of CML alive. And therefore, at that time, we reach a plateau of prevalence. Then the incidence will equal mortality. So 30 years from now, we'll still need to spend money on TKI. Spend more money. I don't want to get this money, but we have to spend the money. So at the diagnosis, we need a bone marrow to be done. Do not rely on fish or PCR or whatever. So bone marrow is important for staging purposes. So bone marrow is important at the upfront. Actually, it will give you the staging base of it percentage, blast pro myelocyte, and you can run a karyotype because if you do efficient PCR, you may not detect other abnormalities unless you have the probe for them. So this is the treatment available for CML today. Interferon, still available and approved, but we don't use it, obviously. Imatinib, nilotinib, dazetib are frontline and salvage. In a second and third line setting, we have ponatinib, bozotinib, and nomastexin. So the agenda of 2014, frontline therapy, three options. Second line, all these options, plus what I mentioned, plus omastexin and transplantation, and plenty of agents in investigational setting. So what are the questions? First question is, what is the best frontline therapy? Second, can we cure CML? Can we stop therapy? Role and timing for transplant, monitoring, and other questions like prevalence and pregnancy and others. So imatinib remains a good standard for this patient. This is an update from the Jimima group in ASH, last ASH meeting. Still, most of the patients will do well with imatinib upfront at 400 mg per day. In a cumulative fashion, a majority will achieve a major molecular response, intent to treat 33%. However, around 65% will remain on the drug, 35% will stop for one way or the other, and that is the reason why we needed the second generation TKIs. So two randomized trials are positive, NSND and Nilotip, showing higher response rate, deeper molecular responses, less transformation, survival is the same. There's no difference in survival so far. Nilotinib does induce a higher rate of optimal responses at three months. Same for dazatinib, we have a higher rate of response to CCYR and MMR, no impact on survival so far. Similar story as well. With dazatinib, you have a higher rate of optimal responses defined by 10% PCR at three months. Now, all these are great. However, they do not impact overall survival. Why? Because we have a good salvage approach for this patient. Unless the frontline trials will show survival improvement, how would I justify prescribing a drug for $10,000? Plus, we know that greatly tolerated, we still see some side effects. For example, the cardiovascular event. With the Zatia, we see pleural effusion, pulmonary hypertension. With Nilotinib, you heard the arterial occlusive disorders, coronary artery stenosis, and others, and these are at a higher rate than imatinib therapy. So, Second gen TKI compared to imatinib induces higher response rate, deeper molecular responses, eventually better tolerated problem is the price. Now, moving forward, in 2015, we expect imatinib to be generic and available. Then if it's cheaper for $500 per year, how you wanna justify using a drug, second gen TKI for $10,000 per month? 
I don't have in 2014 any prognostic factors that can tell me this drug should be given up front. We we'll love to have what we call treatment a la carte, but we don't have it today. And therefore, unless we show improvement in survival or like meaning, meaningful surrogate endpoint, imatinib should be frontline therapy for this patient. Transplant, Dr. Drima mentioned it, where we go for transplant. Advanced age disease, yes, up front, use chemotherapy as a bridge. Elderly patient, 80 years old, forget about transplant. No, for chronic phase patient, you need to fail at least two TKIs. If you fail two TKIs, and then transplant is the way to go. If you respond to TKI, whether front line, second line, or even third line ponatinib, then transplant will be deferred for later on. Monitoring, what do we have tools? Cytogenetics, FISH, PCR, and mutations. So to be simple, gold standard is still CCYR at 12 months of therapy. That correlates with improvement of survival, so you need to get CCYR at that time. In our practice, in patients who achieve a CCYR, we follow them with FISH and PCR every six months early on, and then PCR alone. PCR can fluctuate, so please repeat the testing before you make a change. You heard Dr. Wong mentioning adherence, so every PCR change doesn't mean resistance, and you only check for a mutation in somebody failing to respond, and you are considering a switch of treatment. So you change TKI only in a setting of loss of response. So three months, we all agree three months. If you have a good response, that's great. However, if you don't have it, what do we do? Here's a scenario of three months. You have a PCR of 11.5%, correct? Okay, well, that reflects different scenarios. The first scenario is you're coming down, you're responding so well, it was 11.5 at three months, it's over. No. It can be slow response. Is that the same? Obviously, it's not the same. And yet, we have a value at three months. Or it can be you're taking the drug and you have a PCR at three months, 11.5%, but you're taking the drug. Another patient could be skipping doses because there's side effect and the PCR is still above 10%. Is it the same? No, it's not the same. That means you should not react at three months based on a single value of PCR that is irrelevant and may harm more patients than helping them. So therefore, uh, Dr. Schwab mentioned the data from Sue Branford at ASH, six months predict for long-term outcome. So if you have somebody at three months not doing so well, watch them in six months, reassess them. The rate of progression within three to six months is minimal, 2% or below, and therefore it's safe to wait till six months. No, MMR, yes and no, so far CCYR is a major prognostic factor for outcome, MMR doesn't add much for survival, and in simple terms, six months, 10% PCR, one year complete response. These are the criteria of failure, whether you use NCCN guidelines or the ELN 2013. Mutation, you only check for mutation in somebody not responding, and the aim is to tell you therapy accordingly. Do not check for mutation in somebody responding or upfront. So do not change therapy unless you have somebody losing his response or her response. Now, can we stop therapy? These are the STEAM 1, STEAM 2 trial. Again, failure is defined by loss by uh, the appearance of any PCR positivity. And if you take it this way, 60% will relapse. Now, the question is, can we really challenge them with second-gen TKI again? The majority do respond again. Although in France, they do PCR on a monthly basis. In USA, it's not the case, and therefore it's risky. Short answer is, do not stop therapy outside the clinical trials. No, we did a bone marrow, and we, the bone marrow has shown that I have trisomy 8. I don't have the Philadelphia chromosome. What that means? Abnormalities in no metaphases can be seen. The frequency is really low. However, they are transient in the vast majority of the cases. If you don't see it, repeat your bone marrow within three to six months. Most of the cases will go away. No, sometimes you can have monosomy 7 or some abnormalities predicting an MDS clone. Then you have to transplant your patient, but repeat your karyotype before you make any change. In the vast majority, it doesn't impact the long-term outcome. Pregnancy. I have a patient who came to see me, she was 34 years old at the time. She said, okay, I wanna start on imatinib therapy or dilatib or second gen TKI, and she did well. Now, obviously pregnancy was out of question at the time, but four years down the road, she's doing extremely well, and the question, doctor, when I come pregnant, what is the right answer? A lawyer in the room in the US, in the US you, you say no, pregnancy, you cannot, it's off-label, correct? The label is said you cannot have become pregnant. No, if you have a patient who's a male, his wife can get pregnant, no problems. It's one-time exposure. Now for female, this is the largest data from Novartis registry where the 125 patients on imatinib get pregnant accidentally. 
there was a syndrome reported involving the eyes, the bone, and the kidneys. So the short answer is you cannot get pregnant on imatinib therapy. Now, if I'm responding so well, what do I do? What do I suggest to my patients? Well, here what we'll tell them. We want them to be in a deep response, to have at least MMR or even complete molecular response for a while, for a year at least. And then we we'll tell them if they want to conceive, they stop the drug and try to conceive immediately and watch them without intervention throughout their pregnancy. If they relapse, minimal relapse, you can watch them. And after third, trim after third trimester or be after that, you can resume the treatment. You cannot breastfeed, however. So it's very controversial. Some people use interferon, we do not. But again, uh, for female, it's still a critical problem. No, okay, I failed frontline therapy. What do I have? Here are the list of agents available. Some of them are approved. Second gen TKIs is a summary of all agents. Busy, busy slide, but to tell you, none of them will affect the 59 mutation. The spectrum of mutations are different, are specific for each drug, and they have different side effect profile. So responses, these are not randomized trial. It's a summary of the trial, uh, pivotal trial run so far. They are more or less equivalent, although some of them may not have a durable response. The finish of PF, PFS are not similar, but quite good, better than transplant second line. So do not go for transplant before using second gen TKI. Safety profile, dazatib, we have pleural effusion essentially with nilotib. We do see the arterial problems and NFTs increase and some rash. Bozotinib can cause rash and diarrhea as well. So how we predict for second gen TKI, whether we go for transplant or not, it's our scoring system that Dr. Kim mentioned. We have performance status and previous response to imatinib therapy. If you're doing well to imatinib, you do well with second gen TKI. If you have primary resistance, you don't do so well, and then you think of transplant. Now, I start somebody on second gen TKI. What do I do down the road? We had a study as well, the landmark analysis doing assessing response at three months. Only three months response did predict for survival. And therefore, somebody on a second gen TKI who achieved the CCYR by three months, they do so well, then forget about any other alternative. If you don't have a great response at three months, you monitor your patient and you think of alternative. Yet still, for this patient, survival is 84, is in a 75 to 80% transplant more or it uh, depends on how, what is the likelihood of with my transplant. So, but at least it's a warning, red flag. If at three months you're not doing so well, you may want to think of alternatives. Bozotinib was approved for second for uh, failure. Here are the data from a second line TKI failure. CCYR around 50%, similar to nilotinib and dazatinib experience. In the third line, you have a lower response rate, which is expected. However, major response 39% and complete around 20%. Moving forward, the goal of CCYR may not be very relevant. It's unlikely to achieve a CCYR after fourth and fifth line of uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, but yet still major response uh, are uh, meaningful for this patient. Now, the last drug, ponatinib. Ponatinib is a PAN-BCR-able inhibitor, inhibitory 59 mutation. The drug was approved in the US and Europe and in certain countries in Asia. However, there was a problem with arterial side effect, and the FDA decided to suspend the drug from September till December. Here are the responses. We think it's one of the most potent TKI available in a third line and beyond. You have 60% achieving a major response complete, 50%. They failed all TKIs before. It's unmatched so far. Problem is, and these responses were durable, uh, with a 315i mutation or without 315i mutation in a chronic phase. Problem is, arterial events, report to be around 20% having arterial event. The drug was approved with a black box wording, showing vascular occlusion uh, and venous uh, thrombotic event as well. Based on this data, the FDA said, well, we have to uh, readjust the label of the drug. Now, if we look at these events, when they are happening, they are happening among patients with all the group, having risk factors, having diabetes, using 45 milligram per day. In our practice, we do not use ponatinib at 45 milligram. We use 30 milligram and 15. And with that, we're comfortable. We're not seeing these kind of events. So for ponatinib, optimal dose may be not 45 milligram, 30 milligram, and even lower. The incidence of toxicities of concern are pancreatitis, 7%, but you can assume the drug. Skin rash, like nilotib, at a higher percentage. But the main one is vaso-occlusive disorder, 12%. Hypertension, 6-7%. So you need to optimize all comorbidities, uh, and you need to use lower dose of the drug, and then you watch carefully for side effects and responses.
Omastaxin is approved if you fail two TKIs. It's given sub-Q, 14 days induction, and then seven days maintenance therapy. Responses are not so good as TK, other TKIs. However, it's an alternative if you fail all other options, 10% CCYR. So what we learn about CML therapy? Well, I hope we learn something. This is my message, 2014. Great therapy for CML. CCYR remain a gold standard that correlates with survival improvement. Early responses do matter. Should not change at three months, but definitely at six months. Deep molecular responses are important. They are correlated with improvement in event-free survival. However, no impact so far on transformation nor survival. And CMR, yes, you want to stop drug. However, we have no clear benefits so far. Let's wait and see. And the new drugs are very promising. Thank you very much for your attention. This is my email uh, and my phone. Thank you so much.